<laughs> I'll get this far. Um, so I'm curious, how many people in this room have heard of Alt School? If you could raise your hand. That's some, some. OK. Well, why don't we start with a little bit of the basics? So like a couple years ago, you're a successful entrepreneur. You've sold a company. You sold Aardvark to Google for like $50 million. And you worked at Google for a couple years. And then you know, as you were having kids, you started thinking about education. And in that process, you started an entire school system, right? So can you tell me a little yeah. bit about that process? Uh, that that's in a nutshell. So, you know, I had been at Google, had left, had come back, and, and was there kind of for a few years and started to get that itch to do another startup. And so on the side, you know, with a lot of the people I was working with was thinking kind of what next? What, what's big? What's impactful? What, what is a fit for, you know, what we've been doing at Google and kind of over our careers? And then that was right at the end of 2012, I was applying to preschools for my two-year-old daughter. What, what is it like applying to preschools in San Francisco? Uh, it's pretty miserable. It's like a harrowing, awful experience. Okay. Uh, because there's just not enough space or the, what? Yeah, in a yeah. nutshell, there's just not enough great schools. Okay. And, uh, and so, you know, all the schools that you want to go to have a 99% rejection rate. Okay. And, you know, and you have no idea how to navigate it because you've never done it before. Yeah. You, know, you have a child, it's the first time. And it's, it's very, scary. yeah, it's very loaded. This, this notion of, you know, think about the elementary school that feeds from the preschool you're going to send your kid to, which by implication is about, you know, that elementary school goes to the middle school, goes to the high school, and if you don't pick right for your two-year-old, you know, they're going to be penniless and alone when they're, <laughs> they're 30. And the crazy thing about that is that there's actually some truth to that, uh -huh. that actually, you know, if you, if you get into that great preschool, it makes it that much easier to go to the next phase and the next phase and the next phase, and the, the, you have this kind of winnowing of the funnel. And, well, and also, you know, from a broader conversation, a broader perspective, like a form of creaming. You know, you're taking really, you know, the system is taking really, you know, kid, great kids and, and families with resources out of the public school system. Uh, um, well, and, but, but even, yeah. I mean, even that is a misnomer. The yeah. idea that we have private schools and public schools and that that's where the divide is. I mean, if you send your kids to a public school in Ross, California, that's a private school. You just pay for it yeah. by buying a house that's yeah. much more expensive than the same house in the neighboring district. So, you know, we actually have far more children in the U.S. that go to public schools where they're segregated by the value of their, their property. property tax, right. so to speak, than, than kids that go to private schools where they're segregated by the fact that right. they pay this high tuition. Okay. And so, you know, as a parent, I had a really hard time with the idea that, that I have to go through this many leaps and it's this hard to get a school that at the end of the day really looks pretty darn similar to the school that I went to yeah. you know, 30 years ago. Uh -huh. and, and I think that the world has changed dramatically. I think that I'm in a very different position as a parent versus my parents were or grandparents were. And it seems off that schools you know, don't look different mm -hmm. when the purpose of a school is to actually prepare kids for the future that they're going to experience. And that future is so different than even what exists today, let alone what exists when, when you know, these 100-year schools were made. So you're, you're incredibly frustrated. And then I got to start my own school. Yeah, there was, right? well, so first there was this idea of I got to start my own school. And that was kind of going to be on the side and, and you know, start to look at homeschooling and, and really dig into it and just read a crazy amount about education in the United States and education historically. And, and then there was this aha moment in, I guess, kind of March, April of 2013, where I realized, you know what, actually, the kind of job that I want to have for the next 10 years, 20 years, is working on this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's been an immense luxury to get to work on something that is this big, this long term, and to have the kind of backing to to not say, how can we kind of incrementally improve what's already there? How can we actually take a step back and, and think about what we want to exist mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 years out and, yeah. and start to build that, not, not you know, what's possible given what we have today? Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that's unusual about your approach, is, I mean, when you look at the whole field of ed tech, I mean, it's typically 
you know, an entrepreneur creates software and then they've got to go to these like massive urban school districts where they sell software to them. And you just went straight up and you were said, you said, I'm just going to do the whole thing sort of contained within its own system. So, I mean, could you kind of just yeah. explain that? To I mean, I think that's in, a, in some what's really different about old school and the approach is that, you know, we have right now 45 teachers and 45 engineers and, th and there's not another you know, organization on the planet that has a one-to-one -one ratio between teachers and engineers at that scale. And, and I think as it's gotten easier and easier to launch things and build things and take advantage of everything from new programming languages to you know, open hardware stacks or cloud infrastructure, it's possible to actually do more and more and more things as a startup. And that's what was very different about you know, starting something in 2013 versus 2007 and 1998 when I started mm. my last two companies is you know, we were a full stack company out of the gate. We built hardware, we built software, we hired teachers, we you know, leased space and did construction to get the school open on time and navigated the building department and dealt with lunches and Wi-Fi and, and, and really did end to end the whole thing at very small scale. And I think that that represents a kind of second approach to what folks in education really want, which is, you know, 15, 20 years from, from now, for, for us to really have something that's transformatively different and transformatively better. And so, mm -hmm. you know, one way to do that is to say, okay, let's start at large scale with actually like a pretty narrow slice of functionality, and that's the traditional ed tech approach, mm -hmm. and then to try and grow and yeah. grow and grow that surface area to improve the current, you know, tools in schools. And then this is kind of a different approach. This is saying, well, actually, let's, let's start by creating something very comprehensive and very new and very different where it's at an immensely small scale. You know, we had a one-room schoolhouse with 20 kids a few months after we started. That was what, where what we was started. What was it like setting that up first time? I mean, like, uh, just, what's, the, what's that like? Well, I mean, first off, if we knew how difficult it was, we never would have done it. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a pretty typical um, kind of, thing you'll hear from people starting companies or starting, you know, a, a, a movement. Uh, you know, I, I had worked with someone exceptionally talented in operations at my prior startup, and she was kind of my first call, and I said, Anna, you know, want to do this thing in education, and I think it's essential that we kind of start with an actual school, not mm -hmm. by building the things that we think a school would use. And can you do it? And it's, you know, this is April of 2013, and we wanted to have a school up and running in September of 2013. And she said, yeah, sure, I can do it. And, and to figure out over, you know, a few months, basically, how to do it and attract parents and, you know, go out and, and find amazing child-centered educators who are willing to take that leap and say, we're interested to not mm -hmm. just start a school, but start an entirely new model for what a school system can look like and, and to do that all in kind of four or five months was immensely hard, but it, it also, I think, gave us the confidence to say, you know what, um, if this quickly we can get something that is really compelling, and, you know, and kids and families and educators loved that first mm -hmm. year. And families the next year were enormously attracted to, you know, be part of, of the kind of four locations that we opened mm -hmm. in 2014. And, and as someone that is really a believer in the user-driven approach mm -hmm. where, where you iterate, where you actually kind of build as little as possible and you see, is there a promise here before you spend an enormous amount of resources? That was a big deal to us to see mm -hmm. that, you know, in the very, very early days when we'd done practically nothing, there was still something really compelling. So how many, how many schools do you have today? Where are they? How many students are you? So we have... We have seven schools, 330-some uh, students. There are five sites in San Francisco, and then one in Palo Alto and one in Brooklyn. So if you do the math, um, you know, when we say school, we mean something much smaller. We mean something that, you know, in, in, in one case was in an auto body shop and another 24-hour fitness until literally the months before we open. And the idea there is that, A, if you decouple this, this notion that, like a school has to take place in a 100,000 square foot building with a bunch of administrators and you have to segregate kids by age and you have to do all, you know, have to share the, the gym and the cafeteria according to this fixed schedule. If you kind of break that notion and you say, actually, uh, it is really important there's a classroom culture, it is really important that there's professional educators, you want to double down on those things, but a classroom should really be its own independent unit 
And you know, we have locations where it's literally one classroom in a site. And, and you know, our mixed age middle school that's co-located with our office is 25 kids in you know, like a 1,200 square foot room. And that's what it is. That's the whole school experience. What's, so just for people who've never, don't have an idea of what, what, what's an alt school classroom like? And how is it different from a normal like public school environment. You go in, like, what's the schedule? What's the experience? How is technology laced into it? So, you know, first off, you walk through far fewer doors and down fewer hallways to get to that classroom. And I think that's a big deal. If you have, you know, 500 people doing anything, they're going to be much more restricted in terms of how they can cater to an individual than if you have 50 people doing something or five people mm -hmm. doing something. And, and for us, you know, I, I was running the personalization group at Google, and a lot of the people that, that you know, started old school with me were part of that group. And so personalization is, you know, for us, the hallmark of a 21st century education. And it, and it doesn't mean that kids are doing whatever they want. It doesn't mean that kids are on their own. Quite the opposite. You know, from 9 to 3, you have these long blocks of time where kids are working in small groups, where kids are working kind of as a whole class on project-based interdisciplinary learning that can map back to, for each individual student, you know, what are the right goals? What are the right priorities for them, given not just the, the level of knowledge that they've attained in some subject mm -hmm. matter, but, but you know, ultimately the way they learn, the things that they're interested in, the, you know, the fact that they had a hard day that day, mm -hmm. and they're not up for the same thing that they might be up for on a different day. The ability to really you know, respond to the, the actual child mm -hmm. themselves on both the kind of very short time scale and long time scale, I think mm -hmm. that's what's really different. And the idea that you have different kind of stations that kids can move between in these long blocks of time and you're, you're really spending all of your resources on the classroom educators so you can have a lower student teacher mm -hmm. ratio and really capable, really responsive teachers, that, that in a nutshell is kind of what I think, you know, is, is a different orientation than in a lot of schools, where it's about the institution, it's about a certain way that things have been done and will continue to be yeah. done. I mean, like in a, just to kind of explain, like I've visited an old school classroom before, and like when I was going to school, public school, like, you know, the teacher would have certain set periods of time where they would kind of lecture everyone. Um, but in the old school classroom, there are also blocks of time where kids are actually on iPads kind of working through individual lessons in a, in a playlist, right? And that, that's where the tech sort of comes in, right? Yeah, so, you know, I think the most important technologies are actually invisible from the mm -hmm. classroom. They're about scheduling. They're about staffing. They're about, you know, finding those families in the first place and kind of combining them in the right way to create that balanced classroom mm -hmm. environment. And, and then really planning for that student and, and you know, the... The thing that I think technology does best is it brings down the cost of complexity, right? You think about something like the internet, you think about eBay, you think about Uber, you think about you know, air traffic control systems. These are fantastically complex, dynamical you know, exchanges between lots and lots of people that, that follow rules. They're not a free-for-all. But if you didn't have digital technology, it would be impossible to kind of manage that complexity. Very quickly, you'd have to add layers and layers of yeah. management. You know, it's like there's no amount of dispatchers that you could hire that could provide a service like Uber, mm -hmm. right? And so for us, that's how we most want to use technology is to bring down the cost of complexity so we can be more flexible as it relates to the autonomy of a teacher, as it relates to, you know, the personalization we can offer to a student. And it's captured in that playlist that you described, which is about 20 to 25 items that a student is responsible for each week where they're going to be, you know, working on those projects, they're going to be doing those exercises generally with their peers. And, and you know, I would say if you walk into an old school classroom, about 40% of their kids are doing one thing, you know, maybe 20% of the kids are doing another, 10% of the kids mm -hmm. are doing another, and then you have kind of smaller groups or individuals who are working off of their playlist. But the norm is, you know, for kids to be learning together, but to still be able to map back kind of what a kid did to what actually makes sense for them to do. I think that the two most important requisites for a kind of personalized classroom are you have to be able to represent the significant, you know, actions, the significant work that a student has done digitally. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they should be working digitally. In fact, quite the opposite. The less they're on a screen 
the better if you can stay flexible, if you can stay rigorous mm -hmm. and transparent. And then the second thing is, if something is a waste of a kid's time, they shouldn't have to do it. Mm -hmm. And obviously that, that kind of brings up all kinds of other challenges, which is how do you know what's a waste of a kid's time and how do you, how do you maintain enough flexibility so that you know, if Kim Jr. shouldn't be doing X, Y, Z, she can mm -hmm. actually do something else that is a good use of you know, that, that 30 minutes or that hour. Um, so you recently raised $100 million um, from some of the best known investors in the Valley, um, from Founders Fund, I think uh, Andreessen Horowitz also topped up, uh, and then Mark Zuckerberg and um, Lorreen Powell Jobs. Um, you know, they're not putting money into this just so somebody can just start a private school. Like, you know, the vision here is you want to make it accessible and you want to scale. So how do you, you know, right now I'm looking at the tuition for alt schools and it's like north of $20,000, mm -hmm. but realistically, if you want to, if you really want to make this accessible to, you know, public school students across the country, you've got to bring it down to what, like six, seven K? Like, or how much are they spending not per that, student? I mean, yeah. uh, California, which is on the low end, spends about $9,600, but, <laughs> uh, but that's actually not looking at the fair market value of kind of like the location that they have and a bunch of other things. So right. you're probably talking in the, in the kind of lo very low double digits in terms of like thousands here. But by the way, there's a lot of states where they're spending more than $20,000 per student you know, mm -hmm. in public school. Oh, okay. And yeah. so you look at, you know, in New York, in New Jersey, the, the spending varies quite widely. Um, you know, ultimately, what, what we want is that 15 years from now, the kind of time traveler cliche doesn't, doesn't persist anymore. And, and that's the notion that if, if someone from, you know, the, the 19th century appeared in San Francisco today, the only thing they would recognize is the inside of a classroom. And, um, you know, and, and so what, what we want to be a part of is an ecosystem shift. We want in 2030 for people that would start and run schools to not have such a hard time mm -hmm. to, do it, to do it well. And, and today, I mean, having started schools ourselves, I can, I can say it is phenomenally difficult to run, you know, a bad school, let alone a good school. It's just, it's just too hard to do this thing that we ask of educators and administ uh, administrators and, and kind of policymakers who oversee schools. And so, you know, if you look at a content producer in 2015, for example, and you compare that to content producer in 1995, this enormous ecosystem shift yeah. has happened that we call the kind of internet, but it's not just about technology, it's about kind of shift in cultural norms, it's about policy changes, it's about, you know, movements in capital, and so we want a similar shift to happen. Now, what we've done is to say, look, uh, rather than try and start big, let's, mm -hmm. let's start small, let's make an ecosystem where we're the only inhabitants. And mm -hmm. so, you know, for the first kind of five years of alt school, the focus is on running schools ourselves and starting in what we will, like, absolutely say is an is a idealized environment. Mm -hmm. It's easier to run a urban private school than to run the average public school in America, right? And so you want to start where it's easiest. And we, we think we will get to a point where, you know, 2018, 2019, we can say, we actually have a pretty easy time starting and running great schools. And it's not because we're skimming off the top. It's because, you know, the resources that we're using to run a great school actually will scale. And mm -hmm. at that point, you kind of enter the second phase where we start to invite other people to start and run schools that are kind of powered by that platform. And I think even more importantly, you start to invite other people to kind of contribute to the platform itself, mm -hmm. right? And so we don't aim to be the ecosystem. We aim to be, you know, the operating system player. But there are going to be lots of other players in that ecosystem. And, and again, I think we'll know that we've succeeded when people that run schools don't have mm -hmm. to work so unbelievably hard yeah. to just tread water when actually it's pretty easy to innovate, it's pretty easy to measure the, the actual progress of students in a non-invasive and accurate way and where it doesn't require, you know, 100 hour weeks and the amount of dedication that, mm -hmm. that a good teacher literally has to muster. There's no way yeah. for them to be a good teacher without, without working that hard. So, I mean, in, in this future model, I mean, the idea is that you'll have kind of like, you know, on a platform, you'll have first party schools 
that are alt school run, using alt school software, using alt school methods, and then you'll have a larger network of sort of like third party schools which are run by other educators and they adopt some of your software and techniques, right? And they can potentially modify it or offer it at lower cost. That's right, and yeah. you'll have an enormous spectrum from, you know, a, a really good analogy is kind of Montessori, right? Yeah. So uh, you could do way worse than to describe alt school as working on kind of Montessori 2.0. And if I look at Montessori, I'd say it's probably the best out of the box approach for at least kind of early childhood education for, for preschool and lower elementary. And you know, I, th I think things like Reggio Emilia are, are, are in the yeah. kind of same vein. They're different flavors of it. And so you have strict Montessori and then the entire spectrum all the way to, you know, homeschoolers that are doing a variant of it themselves and everything in between. Public school versions, high-priced private mm -hmm. school versions, high-priced public school versions, you know, low-priced international high school, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so uh, we will always have the, you know, alt schools that we operate ourselves because that, that's where we can kind of push the envelope. That's where we have the most surface area to learn. But over time, the aim is to have a kind of, you know, broader and broader funnel of people mm -hmm. that, that are you know, using similar approaches and using those technologies to start schools and run schools. And again, in the very long term, where you know, a larger school system can say, like, we wanna, we wanna migrate this approach. I mean, look at, again, look at, look at the internet and look at the size of organizations. I mean, mm -hmm. even government agencies now yeah. are migrating to the internet. Even schools are, you know, plugging into broadband internet. So it, so it, it happens. It just happens over a very long time scale. Mm -hmm. Since we have, um, you know, this is a Chinese internet conference, um, what are your ideas on expanding, you know, outside of the United States? I read this, like, amazing article, I think, like, it was, like, at the beginning of last year in the New Yorker about Waldorf schools in mainland China and how that was kind of tapping into... Um, you know, this concern that the mainland Chinese educational system is too focused on rote memorization and testing. And you have kind of like the total opposite approach where it's incredibly individualistic um, or you'd personalize or however you want to call it. So how do you think about expanding outside the U.S.? So again, I think it's all about that second phase. I mean, once we have a model that works for ourselves, that's built on, you know, technology, that's built on structured content, things that actually scale, that, 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 that you can look at a playbook and say, okay, well, I could start there, and I would have a pretty great, you know, lower elementary or middle school experience. At that point, you know, the sooner the better in terms of other people taking that playbook, taking those tools, build on, building on it themselves, contributing it to them, uh, contributing to that ecosystem themselves. And so, you know, we're already talking to people internationally and in China specifically about, you know, on a kind of 2018 timeframe, what would it look like for us to partner with others to start schools? And, and the beauty of using digital technologies in a fundamental way to provide your service is that there's a natural network effect, there's a natural scalability there. And we haven't had that in the education space. You know, the education space spends less than one cent of every dollar on R&D, on you know, improving the future performance of the industry. And, and when you spend, you know, if you spend less than 1% of your time on improving your future self, it, it's not magic. You're going to kind of slowly degrade over time. And the same thing is true for an organization. The same thing is too, true for industries. And so part of our aim is to change that dynamic and make it such that there is real investment and it's investment that can be shared not just nationally but ultimately globally. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're, you know, how many, you're like two or three years into this process, About right? two and a half. Two and a half years in this process. You started multiple schools. Um, you know, here's, you know, like a twofold question, like, A, after going through this process as an entrepreneur, what's the, what are the things that you think, uh, think that are most in need of reform in the public school system? And then alternately, you know, what do you walk away in, you know, sort of in, in awe of like how difficult this whole problem is and what public school edu educators and administrators have to do and deal with? Uh, great question. So, so I, you know, I mentioned one of, one of the reasons why I, I don't think the, the education sector as a whole has kept up with the kind of changes in the world. And, you know, there are, there's 
a fantastic amount of innovation, there's a fantastic amount of success happening kind of on the margins in education. There's so many people doing amazing things that you want to learn from, that you want to propagate. But when you look at the kind of median experience in the US, and I think globally, it, it, it really hasn't changed enough. It really hasn't improved enough over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And so one of the reasons is that we're just not investing in that yeah. improvement. We don't spend the dollars in R&D. <laughs> you know, Moore's Law is not magic. Uh, it doesn't just kind of bubble up from the earth. It happens because organizations and people spend phenomenal amount of time and resources to kind of push out that curve. Um, but I think there's a second issue, which is just this kind of factory model of school, this idea that I'm going to move kids around through, you know, kind of fixed programs from the science room to the math room, you know, now we're going to have a 45 minute block where we do English or foreign language. Um, you know, I'm assessing kids in the same way. I'm kind of uh, dividing up the day and, and running out the clock. That just structurally works, right? So I think one of the things that, that is hardest to change or kind of most, most challenging about the education space is that, you know, like we've got a wheel and the wheel turns and it's very hard to come up with the, the next wheel. And I think that it's it's one of the reasons why, you know, we haven't just figured it out. It's enormously... Well, it's, I mean, we have an incredibly fragmented system in the United States by design. And we were talking about this beforehand. I mean, everything is kind of locally governed, directed. The revenues come in locally. Um, yeah, and that, and that exacerbates the first problem, which yeah. is like it's harder to invest in R&D if you're investing as an individual county or as a as a state, it's one of the reasons why I think a place like China has some real advantages in terms of being able to think of, you know, a, a, a more unified school system. And it's not to say that the Shanghai school system isn't very different than in, in other counties. In some ways, like China is every bit as local as, very as local, the US is, fragmented. but they do have like a federal government that's able to do longer term initiatives, that, that is empowered and that actually has a track record of longer term investments. Um, I think that, that you know, in some ways, with the right kind of culture and the right incentives and the right tools, um, that fragmentation could allow you to innovate faster. Because you could, you know, and that was the original charter school promise, was we'd have a million flowers blooming, and the things that people would discover in one school would spread like wildfire to the others. And, and, it, and it hasn't happened because there isn't that basic interoperability. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's one of the things you really want to see, and, and Common Core, is you know an a kind of first step. Yeah. It's an attempt, and 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 you know, broadband internet to schools is a huge enabler. So I think you're starting to see some of the pieces. It's one of the reasons why I'm very optimistic mm -hmm. that you know 20 years from now things will be much more different than over the last 20 years or over the last you know 50 years. Um, I think that that you know the. The, the best thing we have in the education space, you know, something that I'm in awe of is just the dedication of the people that work in schools. You know, the amount of sacrifice required is, it's not good for the country, frankly. It's not good no. for the world that it, it takes so much sacrifice, it takes so much effort to be a good teacher. But the fact that you're seeing millions and millions of people in the United States and, you know, like orders of magnitude more internationally who who are putting in that effort. I almost feel like if the deck wasn't stacked against them, if they actually had some good tools, the kind of tools that you or I have in the workplace that makes our ability you know, transformatively different than 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And it's, it's not a silver bullet. It's not, it's not like, oh, if I took away you know, your calendaring software, or if I took away your ability to Google search, then like, you have no power. No, it's, it's, it's literally dozens or even hundreds of different enablers that have come together. And I, and I think that you know, we're on the cusp of being able to deliver that to the educators who, who again, I think are, are basically swimming against the current mm -hmm. in terms of having the same set of tools for what today is a much harder problem than it was 50 years ago. If you think of schools as needing to prepare kids for the future, a couple generations ago, it was a lot easier to predict what the future would be. That makes the job of preparing kids for that future much easier. Today, you know, and, and you look at cliches like it's 65% of the jobs kindergartners will have haven't been invented yet. I don't know what the exact stat is, but, but 
it's, it's a huge fraction yeah. and, and it's climbing steadily with each year and each decade. And that makes the job of a teacher much harder. And, and we haven't kept up in terms of, of making the tools they have, making the methods they have better. You know, Montessori, which I, again, like I laud and I think is great, it's, it's over 100 years old, yeah. right? And there's only so much prescience that a nun in the early 1900s can have about what a middle schooler in 2015 needs to do to prepare for you know, the community and the relationships and the job that they want to have in 2025. Mm -hmm. Cool. We are several minutes over time, <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you. I can't see the clock, so yeah, I no, take no, no. no I responsibility. See the clock. Yeah, no, I couldn't see the clock. Thank you. <laughs>